Andrew Huberman's enlightening video sheds light on the transformative potential of sunlight, an often underappreciated and abundant source that surrounds us. A source of vitamin D, of energy, of all things good. By delving into this powerful natural element, we can significantly influence our overall well-being. If you don't get that morning sunlight, for one day, no big deal. But if you don't do it for two days or three days in a row, what happens is that morning increase in cortisol still happens, but it starts getting pushed out towards the afternoon. Huberman reveals a world of possibilities that are just kind of waiting to be explored. Recognizing and harnessing the power of sunlight allows us to take a proactive approach to improving our health and elevating the quality of our life. So you get up in the morning, you go outside and you get some bright light in your eyes. Each day becomes an opportunity to embrace the radiance and vitality that's offered by sunlight, paving the way for a brighter and healthier existence. What light does is it sets the foundation of our abilities and it does that indirectly and directly. The way that we function is by way of our nervous system. Our nervous system links all the organs of the brain and body. So we've got brain, spinal cord, but then of course, spleen, heart, lungs, etc. And the nervous system is the system that coordinates all of those. In his thought-provoking video, Huberman immerses us in the intricate relationship between sunlight and our physical and mental health. Through his captivating exploration, he presents a compelling perspective that encourages us to tap into the abundant benefits of this omnipresent natural phenomenon. I always say, are you getting sunlight in your eyes within an hour of waking up? And people always think I mean you have to watch the sun rise across the horizon. I don't do that. but. It's low, so the cells in your eye that, that send all these good signals during the day are looking for what's called low solar angle. This initial step forward unveils an inspiring path brimming with potential for holistic well-being. It invites us to start exploring where we can find many ways to get better and easily make them a part of our daily routines. By embracing the profound influences of sunlight, we unlock a world of possibilities to enhance our, our lives, dudes. And dudettes, I'm sorry, Getting sunlight in your eyes early in the day, even if it's through cloud cover, we mm -hmm. talk about how to do that. I would put right up there in the top batch of mental health, physical health, and performance enhancing behavioral tools. And it's completely zero cost. It takes a little bit of time. By introducing the concept of utilizing sunlight as a transformative tool for self-improvement, Huberman offers a notion that resonates deeply and ignites our curiosity, or at least my curiosity. Probably shouldn't speak for you. This introduction serves as an excellent starting point, opening the door to a captivating exploration of our interconnectedness with nature and the myriad of ways that we can harness its benefits. With each step forward, we uncover the potential to cultivate a harmonious relationship with sunlight, leading to a more vibrant and fulfilled existence. It is locked inside of our skull and body and it has no knowledge of the outside world and vision, um, which involves photons, light energy, um, reaching the eyes, getting converted into electrical signals is the way that the nervous system decides when to be alert and functional and when to be asleep. Hubermang's insight provides a captivating exposition on sunlight's indispensable role in regulating bodily functions and influencing emotional well-being. His perspective observations invite us to venture deeper into our intrinsic bond with the natural world, prompting us to examine how we align ourselves more effectively with its rhythms for improved health. While this understanding is crucial, it does serve as a mere prologue to an exhilarating journey towards holistic well-being. So they're looking for when the sun is low relative to the horizon, but it doesn't have to just be crossing the horizon. Usually they say no, and I say, do you see sunlight before you see your phone, before screen light? And usually they say no. And so I say, well, just try and get two to 10 minutes of sunlight. And they say, well, it's cloudy where I live. I don't live in sunny California like you do. The path before us promises a multitude of discoveries and advancements, offering profound transformations in our physical and mental health as we navigate the vast realm of interconnectedness with nature. When you wake up in the morning, your brain and body have effectively been in the dark, regardless of uh, what sleep environment you happen to be sleeping in. And you have a set of neurons, nerve cells in the back of your eye, and a little structure called the neural retina. It's a little three layered structure. And those nerve cells, are not involved in detecting the shapes of things. What they are essentially looking for, what activates them is bright light, ideally from sunlight. And when bright light, ideally from sunlight, reaches the eye, 
those particular neurons send a signal off into the vaulted dark of the brain. Uh, they do that by way of a little wire called an axon. Uh, and they communicate with an area of the brain that's vitally important called the hypothalamus. It sits right above the roof of your mouth and it harbors a bunch of structures that are responsible for hormones like testosterone and estrogen, for um, cortisol release um, in other locations in the body. Basically controls when you're gonna be alert, when you're gonna be asleep, your hormones, your immune system function, and your appetite and your mood. So this morning signal of getting bright light in your eyes is absolutely vital. Now, how does one do this? The best and ideal way to do this would be to wake up, go outside, and get some bright light in your eyes without sunglasses. If you have to wear corrective lenses or contacts, that's absolutely fine. If you think about what corrective lenses and contacts do, they actually focus light onto the retina precisely, as opposed to when people uh, don't wear those. Uh, if they have vision problems, it's because the light actually falls in front of or in back of the retina, so-called you know, uh, nearsightedness and farsightedness. So the corrective lenses actually help focus the light to these neurons. Through his insightful discourse, he invites us to reevaluate and embrace our relationship with the sun, a bond that holds the potential to dramatically influence our physical health and mental stability. This initial understanding acts as the opening chapter in a personal growth and wellness narrative. Now, the ideal situation would be a nice, bright, clear day. You get five to 10 minutes of sunlight. You don't have to look directly at it. In fact, never look directly at any light of any kind that's so bright that it's painful to look at. But you'd get some light indirectly through your, into your eyes, some bright sunlight. And you would go inside and get ready for your day. By doing that, you, you do a number of things. First of all, every cell in your body has a 24-hour clock, meaning there's a timer that goes from zero to 24 and then repeats. And that's true from the day you're born until the day you die. However, every cell in your body has a, its own separate clock. And the way that those clocks are coordinated into coherent action is from a signal from this brain structure called the hypothalamus. And the only way that signal can arrive properly is if you're getting light to trigger the hypothalamus to say, okay, it's the start of the day, everybody start. Otherwise, your body slowly over time becomes a little bit of a clock shop where every clock is on a different timer and it's alarming at different times. This is actually what happens when you travel and you get stomach issues or you're not feeling right from jet lag your body clocks are, um, the individual clocks of the cells in your body are falling out of, of sync. Okay, they're becoming what we call um, unentrained or as asynchronous. So you get up in the morning, you go outside and you get some bright light in your eyes. However, many people, including me, wake up before the sun is out. In fact, um, I'm up uh, you know, early this morning and there's a very little light in the sky. The sky is just a pale gray right now. In that case, it's very simple. Flip on as many bright artificial lights as possible ideally overhead lights, because the neurons in the eye that perceive this light and send that signal to the brain reside in the lower half of the eye and therefore, because of the optics of the eye, they actually view the upper visual field. So as you notice, I've got some bright lights on behind me, um, but sunlight is really the key. And so once the sun is out, it's very important to get outside and get anywhere from, you know, five to 20 minutes of bright light exposure. A lot of people can't afford the time of 20 minutes. As we embark on the voyage of harnessing the power of sunlight, we illuminate the path towards a healthier and more balanced life, navigating through the intricate interplay between nature and our very own well-being. So the main way in which our body and nerve cells and liver cells and gut cells know what time of day it is, is by the rising and setting of the sun. And it's not consciously perceived. It's not like you say, oh, there's the sun, I see the sun, there it's setting. There's actually, in a subconscious way, there's a specific set of neurons in the eye called melanopsin ganglion cells. These are cells that were discovered by a guy at Brown University named David Burson. These cells perceive the particular, they, they are activated by the particular wavelengths of light created by low solar angle when the sun is low in the sky and when it's setting again low in the sky. So rising and setting the low solar angle when it's directly overhead, high solar angle. So what's interesting about this is that these cells when activated, send a nerve pulse to a set of neurons that sit right above the roof of your mouth called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Those cells secrete a bunch of things into your body and organize the timing of all the cellular processes, all the cellular processes in your body. Now, it's not like your liver cells need to be active at the same time as your heart cells. Your heart has to be active 20, around 24 hours around the clock. Your gut has to do its thing at a particular time. So think of your body kind of like a factory and 
every portion of that factory needs to do different things at different times a day. So when okay. the sun is low in the sky, you can look at it directly much yeah. more easily without pain. But if it's painful, it's okay to blink. Okay. Uh, don't damage your eyes on account of trying to get the sunlight. Here's the idea, a little bit of background just to kind of nest this in something. Every cell in your body has a little 24 hour clock. Viewing the sun, in particular morning sunlight, on a consistent basis, I would say 80% or more of the days of your life is what you should strive for. So it could be 100%, could be 80, but try and do this daily. What it does is it aligns all of those clocks in a very precise way. And it does this by activating specific neurons in your eye called the intrinsically photosensitive melanopsin ganglion cells, but forget, that's all geek speak, connects to your brain and informs all the cells of your body what's going on in the outside world and aligns them. So imagine going into a clock store with every clock as an alarm clock and they're on different schedules. Mm -hmm. That's what happens if you don't view morning sunlight. When you do view morning sunlight for about, I would say five minutes to 10 minutes on a clear day, try and face in the direction of the sun. Don't do it through a window. Don't do it with sunglasses on. Find to wear eyeglasses or contacts, even with as UVB protection. Don't wear a brimmed hat. You know, just look in the general direction of the sun, even if you have to be on your phone, but just kind of get some sunlight in your eyes and blink if you need to, if it's painful. Look away from it a little bit if it's really bright. That morning sunlight coordinates all the cellular or and organ systems of your body and does a couple of things. First of all, it boosts a number of chemicals that need to be released early in the day, such as cortisol, which is healthy if it's released early in the day, and the so-called catecholamines, which are dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. What is that? Oh, excuse me, dopamine, norepinephrine, and, and uh, epinephrine. What does that do? It gives you increased focus, energy, and alertness through the morning, increased immune system function throughout the day, focus throughout the day. And it sets a timer on some other clocks in the body, including the one that releases melatonin about 16 hours later to make you sleepy and fall asleep easily. Now we know this stuff and we screw up too, right? It's like <laughs> nobody's immune to that. But what you can do is if you can see a little bit of sunlight in the evening when low solar angle is happening because the sun is setting, Remember, you don't have to look directly at the sun. It doesn't have to beam you in the eyes, but getting outside and getting those photons reflecting off surfaces and maybe even a, some direct light if you're lucky, like a sunset, it offsets the negative effects of light in the middle of the night. And that mm. effect is quite long. This is a beautiful paper uh, that was published in Scientific Reports that shows that it protects you against some of the negative effects of artificial light in the middle of the night. You don't get that morning sunlight for one day, no big deal. But if you don't do it for two days or three days in a row, what happens is that morning increase in cortisol still happens, but it starts getting pushed out towards the afternoon. And that is strongly associated with depressive symptoms, anxiety, mm -hmm. and sleeplessness at night, which then just makes it harder to Fall function during the next the day. Next day. Yeah. So getting five to 10 minutes of morning sunlight when it's clear out in your eyes, when it's clear out on an overcast day, people say, there's no sun here. Okay, look. Unless you live in a cave, there is sun. I don't care if you live in Seattle in winter or Tromsø, Norway in winter, there is sun. You gotta go outside and see it. And the goal is to really flip on as many artificial bright lights throughout the day. Most people make the mistake of not getting morning sunlight in their eyes or driving to work with sunglasses or looking at the sun through a windshield. Then they get to work and it's kind of dimly lit because they have windows that are tinted. And so you're never getting enough light in your eyes early in the day. Then they go home at night and here's the diabolical thing. From 10 p.m. to 4 a.m., you really wanna keep the lights dim. If you wanna put in red light bulbs, that's even better. That's kind of geeky. Um, you can just, sorry, red light vendors, but you can literally just go buy red party lights. It works yeah. just as well in most cases. These aren't the ones to bask in front of naked. I suppose you can do that too. But the point is that you wanna avoid getting bright light in your eyes from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. Why? That plummets dopamine and melatonin, disrupts sleep, and can lead to issues in next day cortisol and even learning issues. This was beautifully shown by Samar Hattar at National Institutes of Mental Health. He's a good friend of mine, but also a fabulous circadian biologist. So morning sunlight on a cloudy day, maybe 10 to 20 minutes, really overcast day. If it's really overcast, you wake up, ah, oh, it's ugly out. Your goal should be to get outside, be under an overhang, try and get some light in your eyes with no sunglasses. Then during the day, you really wanna crank the lights. On a clear day, get outside. When I wake up, I make a beeline for sunlight. Uh, so I'm gonna get sunlight in my eyes. For the, you know, I'll probably go into the grave saying this, so forgive me if people have heard me say this before, but the single best thing you can do for your sleep, your energy, your mood, your wakefulness, your metabolism <laughs> is to get natural light in your eyes early in the day. Don't wear sunglasses to do it. it takes about 10 minutes or so. Um, if you live in a cloudy area, if you're in the UK in the winter, 
yes. Or the summer. Or the summer, maybe you resort to some artificial light as a replacement, but as much as one can get bright, natural, and if not natural, artificial light in your eyes early in the day without sunglasses, contacts and eyeglasses are fine. Don't try and do it through a window or windshield. It's going to take far too long. This sets in motion a huge number of different neurobiological and and hormonal cascades that are good for you, reduces stress late at night, offsets cortisol, a million different things really that are good for you. So I get that. I think most people, I would say about 75% or more people who have sleep issues find that getting this morning sunlight in their eyes, again, not through a window or windshield. People are like, can I do it through a window? Can I just look at the sun on an Instagram post? It's like, no, you actually have to go outside, okay? It's like a free resource, but just do it. It's pleasant. Um, bring your kids with you or whatever. Uh, getting that sunlight in your eyes, then try and catch the sun before it sets in the evening or even just get outside for a few seconds, even for a conversation at work, step out in front of the building. And then in the evening, dim those screen lights if you're out on stage and you get the blaring lights in your eyes and you're mm -hmm. dealing with that afterwards, there are some things that, that can help. And then for most people, you know, make sure you're not going to bed right after chugging a big glass of water. One of the most common w problems with sleep is people wake up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. I totally just, normal. I just saw this, by the yeah, way. Totally you said normal. sipping is different than Yeah, going. so when a lot of people don't realize this, that of course the total amount of fluid that you ingest dictates whether or not you'll need to go to the bathroom. But when you slug down more than four ounces of liquid in one shot, there's a signal that's sent from the gut and the bladder to the brain that you need to excrete fluid. And so what's going to happen is you're going to be waking up to use the bathroom a few hours later. Try and sip your last drink of the, of the night. That is fascinating. Yeah. I had no yeah. idea. It helps in about, I would say about 70, again, about 75% of people are like, oh, I'm sleeping more through night or I'm only getting up once. Early in the day, you need a lot of bright light to trigger this mechanism. The irony is that in the middle of the night, you need very little light to trigger a separate mechanism that we'll talk about that's actually very bad. So when you view morning light in this way, from and if you wake up before the sun, turn on artificial lights, but when you view morning light in this way, it triggers activation of the cortisol pulse, which is a healthy pulse of a hormone that puts your system into a general state of focus and activation for the day. It also sets off a timer of about 16 hours that runs down. And after that 16 hours, the melatonin pulse starts coming up. So that melatonin is gonna put you to sleep. The cortisol is gonna help you move through your day. It's also gonna protect you against infection and things like that. Not every infection, but it's gonna enhance the immune system. A lot of people know this, but stress hormones in the short term actually in, enhance and invigorate the, nerve, the immune system. This makes sense. If you've ever been working, working, working really hard and then you stop and rest, you get sick when you rest not when you're in full states of getting after it, so yeah. to speak. Because in times of famine or times of lack of food, you need to be able to move and find things and support your children and do all these things. You couldn't afford to get sick. So right. the nervous system recruits the immune system.